Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Hey everybody, it's Paul Yeager, and this is the MTOM Show podcast, a production of Iowa PBS and the Market to Market TV show. If you have any feedback, story ideas, or just want to converse with me, paul.yeager at Iowa. PBS.org is my email. Now, this is a guest I found via Twitter. Jacqueline Holland is a market analyst with Farm Futures, but she's also a dairy farm native from Northwest Illinois, went to Illinois State, went to Purdue for her master's, now lives in Colorado and breaks down the commodity markets. During this time, she has kept an active athletic style with triathlons, and one of the emphasis of triathlons is running. And that is the theme that is going to get us to the Olympics. We're going to talk about specifically the women's track and field team and an athlete named Ellie Perrier St. Pierre. And she is a name you should pay attention to when it comes to the one mile and two mile races. Ellie is a dairy farmer, lives on a farm, grew up on a dairy farm in Vermont. Her husband still operates a dairy and she's still involved with it. So we're going to talk about how these two have some commonalities, but what's the importance of the background when it comes to getting up at 5 a.m., 4 a.m., 3 a.m. to do whatever it is that you do, whether it's milking the cows, running, or analyzing the commodity market. So that is our installment of the podcast this week. Enjoy. All right, Jacqueline. So it's early in the morning. Which has inspired you? I don't know if inspired is the right word. What's forced you to get up early the, the most? Is it your running background, your dairy background, or the now job background? Which one drives you to get up in the morning? Well, this morning it was the job background. But, I mean, any day over the last three weeks or so, it's been a combination of all of the above. So uh, we have market analysts that get up at like 2.30, 3 o'clock, 3.30. Are you in that ballpark sometimes? Uh, sometimes. For the most part, I'm usually up around 4, 4.30. And just kind of take a look at what went on in the Asian markets overnight and kind of get ready to see what other reports are coming out for the day that farmers need to be ready for. And what time did you get up when you were back on the dairy farm in Northwest Illinois? Uh, on days when I was milking, it was, my alarm would go off at three, but I usually couldn't get out of bed till 3.30. Um, and then days when I'd be running, um, I'd usually get to sleep in. So I usually <laughs> sleep in until like five or so. Yeah. Sleep until five. I love it. Yeah. Uh, so tell me about the home area. Yeah, near Galena, but that's not the hometown. Tell me about the home farm and the home area. So I grew up in Apple River, Illinois, which is a small town in Joe Davies County, Illinois, uh, in the northwestern region. Um, my family has a 300 cow dairy farm, and um, in recent years, they've also started raising, I think about 200 head of Holstein steers. And then my younger brother has a 40 cow beef herd and eight head or eight hogs that he's also finishing out uh, with milk for, uh, for just family and friends. Um, and Lived there my whole life. Um, went to school down in central Illinois at Illinois State. That's where I really kind of developed my passion for ag finance. Um, after college, I worked at a bank in uh, Stevenson County, Illinois for a little while, uh, but wanted to do more in the ag sector. So I went to Purdue. I got my master's in ag economics. I uh, came out to Colorado. I worked for Pilgrim's Pride, the poultry division of JBS, as well as uh, Leprino, which is the world's largest 
uh, mozzarella producer. And uh, that's when my boss from Farm Futures found me and asked if I wanted to write about grain markets and start to engage more with farmers, which growing up on a farm, I've wanted to do that for years. So that's kind of how I got to be where I am. So as a young woman who was figuring out what to do, is are you in the spot, the ideal spot where you thought you'd end up? Oh, not, nope, not at all. <laughs> not at all. And that is an absolute blessing because I've just learned so much along the way and I've had so many different experiences. I had never planned on working in food manufacturing. Um, I have always been very passionate about food and food production. So it was an area that even though it wasn't um, as closely related to farming as I would have liked, I still was interested in it and I learned so much from it. I've been able to take uh, so many of those experiences I learned while working for food processors and I can apply those to my daily market reports for Farm Futures. So it's it wasn't the path I dreamed of when I was little, but it has really paid dividends for me. And let's be honest, companies love the dairy DNA in someone because they know how dedicated and daily, twice a day that you have to be. Uh, and they're like, okay, yeah, Jacqueline will be fine. She Dairy farm, she, she'll be fine. We don't have to worry about her dedication, right? Yes, well, and it really paid off when I worked for the cheese company um, because I was kind of able to provide some more insights to looking at, um, like, analyzing milk samples and how that in impacted the cheese-making process. So you can... It's all about it's all about just kind of making it work. <laughs> That's right. Uh, when you went to Illinois State, was what was you told me what the degree was, but what were you did you end up with the degree you thought you were going for? I started out at Illinois State with um, a finance and poli sci major. I eventually switched that to finance and ag business. Um, I found the first semester that I was gone, all of my new friends were asking about the farm and, you know, we would talk, I loved, I've always loved talking about food. So kind of talking about how food production works too. And I realized I really, even though I didn't want to keep waking up to milk cows, I still really liked being a part of the you still like being a part of the dairy industry, and you still yes. are today, but that's not the main focus of, uh, we'll get to your job in a minute. I want to get to Purdue. Uh, why Purdue? Um, they have one of the best agricultural economics programs in the world, so that was my big draw. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with Mike Gunderson who was one of the leading figures at the Center for Food and Agricultural Business at Purdue at the time. Um, and when he offered me the spot, I just, I had so enjoyed my visits with him. He is hands down one of the smartest people I know, um, one of the best leaders and managers I've ever had the great fortune to work for. Um, and I just kind of knew that if I worked with him, I would just be exposed to so much more than any other play, any other school I could imagine. And I was right. It, it was a great experience, and I learned so much. Let's fast forward. I mean, you've kind of talked about the dairy business that you were in working with cheese. Now it's analyzing, um, providing commentary. Uh, we kind of talked about the daily grind that you have. You look at what's going around the world. What's going on around the world right now from where you see it uh, in dairy? So I, um, we are like still kind of recovering from the pandemic. Uh, we're definitely seeing much more comfortable profit margins, 
than we have seen in the past four or five years. Um, that said, there's still a lot of producers that are struggling to get over the economic distress of the past few years. Um, obviously, the pandemic did not help that at all. But, you know, we're seeing a lot more consolidation, a lot more bigger dairies, uh, and a lot fewer smaller dairies. So at least from my family's standpoint, we're trying to kind of figure out how to create more efficiencies and how to really kind of figure out how to capitalize on some of these niche markets as well. So. The dairy is, you know, the dairy and the food business is, um, there were some in dairy that felt that a person who was part of the U.S. Dairy Export Council going back to USDA uh, was going to maybe have some good benefits, at least understanding of the industry. Is it too early to tell yet on if Tom Vilsack has been able to help the dairy industry from his, I, I we'll call it his new old position as Secretary of Agriculture? From our point of view, I think it still is a little bit early. Um, we're still only six months into having Tom Vilsack back as USDA, as the head of the USDA. Um, I I will say anecdotally, anecdotically, it was just, it brought a, a real sense of relief back to producers that we have someone back at the helm of USDA who is so focused on nurturing those international relationships because exports are so critical to the dairy industry right now. In your region, it's dry. Uh, nearby, it's dry. Uh, Montana, South Dakota, North Dakota, everybody's kind of feeling this pinch of maybe some liquidation of herds, livestock. What's this drought long-term tail going to be for livestock? I I listened to your, uh, your podcast with Shaylee Stewart from a couple weeks ago, um, and I, I don't know if I can say anything better than she could. Uh, I, I am very concerned about the liquidation of cattle in the upper Midwest and um, upper plains too, and West. Uh, I will say the South, a lot of the that cattle has moved towards the South uh, because they have received so much more rain this year. Um, but it's a little concerning. It's it's very concerning too when looking at grain markets because this larger cattle herd that we had at the beginning of the year played such a critical role to grain disappearance. So it's it's something I'm definitely nervous about. And you know, as some of those cows leave the regions, you also see some really impactful um, side effects to the local economies too. And the one thing that we've noticed in our region with there be in my parents' region, as there are fewer and fewer dairies, there's fewer and fewer support uh, businesses for those dairies. So it's, I, I think I'm more worried about it from a larger community economic impact. Um, and I'll let the beef analysts kind of, <laughs> I'll let them take the spotlight on uh, explaining the market impacts. That's all right, but it all kind of intertwines. So I guess I'll, uh, I'll put you on the spot one more time about this time about grain. Um, are you more concerned at the beginning of the day, the middle of the trade, or in that last 20 minutes, 40 minutes of the trade right now, or even the overnights? What one gets your blood pressure going uh, watching the, the, the board of trade anymore? Um, it's something that I, I follow it through the day. Um, my biggest focus is first thing in the morning, looking to see what happened overnight and looking to see what, what could start the trading day off um, either on a high note or a low note that farmers may need to know about to adjust their marketing plans. So beginning of the day is really key for me. I try to keep an eye on it throughout the day, um, but 
as for as volatile as prices have been lately, um, I really kind of try to keep a um, nuanced view on some of these really big market moves and um, both as they happen in both directions. And um, with marketing, it's all about kind of maintaining maintaining uh, maintaining like that average price trajectory. So a trade up the limit one day and then down the limit the next day, while you're still going to net out, I think it's more impactful to take a look at those longer term trends because that's what farmers are focused on when they're sitting down and trying to create their marketing plans. I don't know how anybody's doing it right now because, yes, uh, you've got some that they get every update on their phone and they see a, a, a move and set it and forget it um, and know what your price point is, is has been a common set of advice, and I kind of hear you talking it that same way. So my question, uh, let's pivot to when do you get a run in now? When do you work out? I usually go for a run after I finish the morning reports. So around 6 a.m. Uh, Colorado time. All right. So what are you thinking about then? Are you a podcast listener, a music listener, the silence of your feet? What do you listen to? I So my, run, my running time and my workout time is the time where I just try to decompress from the craziness that's going on with the markets. Um, I listen to music. I'll listen to, um, I like listening to comedy podcasts and news podcasts too. So I do that to recharge so that when I finish my workout and come back to looking at markets for the rest of the day, I'm recharged. I am ready to go and I'm able to, um, I'm able to kind of read between the tea leaves a little better when we're in the middle of such volatile market shifts. So, all right, comedy. I got to get your taste of comedy now. Who's your? What comedy things do you listen to? Just I, I like good comedy too. Oh, man, um, it's something that my husband and I really kind of got into during the pandemic. I was watching comedy specials and comedy podcasts. Um, I really like Bert Kreischer. He has a really funny podcast. Um, uh, Girls Gotta Eat. It's a pair of comedian, uh, female comedians out of New York who kind of joke about dating and relationships. Um, those are my uh, This American Life by NPR. It's it can be equally funny, equally um, it can be equal parts funny and equal parts equal parts heartbreaking, but it's always entertaining. So kind of a wide range. Yeah, th This American Life, Peter Tubbs, one of our producers, he's a huge fan of that one. He doesn't miss that one at all. Um, you excited about the Olympics? Very excited about the Olympics. Why? So as a runner, um, and I also do triathlons, there are a lot of sports that I get to watch professional athletes just thrive at. Um, and it just is so inspiring for me as I'm training to watch their success and try to emulate that on my own, on, uh, on my own level. The, and that, and the triathlon doesn't get necessarily, uh, all the coverage, um, not at, just at the Olympics, but in general, there's any, you have to be really looking for any of that type of coverage. So when the Olympics come around, uh, you get to see a whole bunch of running events. Is there any one particular event you're really going to watch maybe this year? Yes. This year, I will definitely be watching Ellie Purrier St. Pierre in the mile. Um, I grew up running the mile in high school track and still do a lot of distance running. So I really enjoy her story because she is also a dairy farmer. So we have a lot in common. <laughs> and she has uh, embraced it a little bit tongue in cheek, but, you know, like, yes, I'm a dairy farmer, but she embraces it, which is exciting. She does. She, um, she is a very vocal advocate for her community. 
for the dairy industry. Uh, she's sponsored by Cabot Cheese. Um, and I just think that's really great because how many professionals, how many professional athletes do you see that are sponsored by a local cheese company? And she is in the East, uh, in Vermont. Um, and we think of dairies, uh, I guess, in your studies. Um, you know, what do we know about the dairy industry in Vermont? And if is it different than other states? So Ellie grew up on a 40-cow dairy farm. And I believe her family's farm is organic. So it's a little bit different from my background growing up on a conventional dairy. But she still grew up milking cows. Her parents still milk. Um, her husband also has a dairy farm. So, and she posts pictures regularly of her out with the calves, um, riding along in the tractor during hay season. And, um, you know, there, there definitely are a little bit of, there definitely are differences in that area of the world. There are some, there are still a lot of smaller dairies, um, but I just really enjoy seeing someone from the ag, or someone who um, is still staying true to their ag roots, even though she's off r running around the world and setting all of these records. Do you think her success has been better for agriculture, for dairy, for women's running. Uh, you know, I mean, she's been outstanding. Uh, she's had a great 2021. Oh man, it's hard to say, you know, which which one she has the most impact to. Um, you know, I think I think for the dairy industry, I think it I think she's just doing such a great job of showing that the dairy industry does create so many good nutritional products that are so good for athletes. Um, milk is 78% water and then, um, or yeah, 78% water and then the rest is protein, calcium, magnesium, lactose, um, fat. And these are all just really good nutrients for athletes, especially as they recover. Um, the casein protein in milk especially is so important for athletes after they recover from a workout. Um, I try to drink a glass of milk before I go to bed the nights after I've done a hard run because the protein helps my body to recover so much better. And I notice a difference in the morning. Um, and then for women in running, she works so hard. She advocates for her community so well, uh, for her home community, as well as for the running community and for, for women in running as well. Um, so she's, she's just done so much and it's, it's so inspiring for, like you said, women in running, people in the dairy industry, and uh, athletics in general. I asked you a question earlier about um, kind of like what you as a, as a young woman thought about. Do you think that Ellie is an inspiration to young women? I mean, you just kind of said it that, that she is. Is she inspirational to some of those young farm girls and young farm boys of their, well, not necessarily, I don't want to say everybody needs to leave the farm, but that you can leave the farm. And it doesn't have to necessarily be in agriculture. It can be in something else. Absolutely. I mean, she, she Ellie runs 80 miles a week as part of her training regimen, which is pretty standard for a professional athlete. And, you know, as myself, not being on the farm anymore, but still loving the farm and loving my family and, and wanting them to be successful, um, she's just such a shining example that even if you can make it back to the farm, there's still so many great ways to be supporting agriculture and to be helping those in the agriculture community be successful. So you can still, you can still branch out and chase your dreams, but still stay true to your roots. 
And LA is going to run in late July, early August at, at, at the Olympics, at least as we sit here and record this uh, in mid-July. Uh, the Olympics are still a go. It'll be a shame if something would happen. But, uh, you know, as the virus pops back up over there, uh, what, have you met Ellie? I guess I'll start there. I have not. I follow I follow the, the running community pretty closely on uh, social media. So I do follow her pretty closely on there, but I have not met her. And we're in a pretty small niche here. I mean, you two, uh, how many women are there that uh, dairy farm run uh, is still involved in agriculture? Is, is that a bigger niche than I realize? I have seen more and more women pop up on social media who are very passionate about fitness but are also still very passionate about um, about the agriculture community and their work within it. Um, Renee Clark in southwestern Wisconsin, she has run 19 marathons. She's a mom to three beautiful little girls, and she is she plays a pivotal role on her family's dairy farm. Um, and that's just so inspiring to me to see that, you know, as a woman, we can pursue all of these different interests and career career and life paths, and we can still be successful. And, you know, along the way, we can help inspire and lift up other people as well. Do you... I absolutely agree. And I, and I don't mean to, I, I guess I didn't want to make it sound like I'm just, oh, as a woman. Uh, but as, a, I mean, guys too. I mean, you always hear about these. I, I'm sure there's probably somebody in the NBA or in the NFL that's got a dairy background, and I just don't know. But with the Olympics coming up, it's always fun because as a sports announcer as well, you always like a, a, a story that you can talk about. And when you can sit there and say, you know, well, you know, Ellie, you know, you'd ask her, you know, I'm sure she'll get asked if she would say when have a great race, maybe win the gold of, you know, do you miss, what time do you have to be back to milk the cows in the morning type of a thing, you know? It's always, yes. the dairy community has that camaraderie that you just can't shake. Even if you're off the farm, you still ask, do you miss who's the dairy Who's milking the thing? cows? Yeah, who's yes. milking? Yes. I always wonder. All right, Jackie, <laughs> I appreciate your time and uh, enjoy the Olympics. And in, enjoy, you know, getting up at 3.30, 4, and sleeping until 5 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs> My thanks to Jacqueline Holland for her time and her insight. And again, if you have any feedback for me, mark it to market at iowapbs.org. Thank you for watching, listening, or reading. We'll see you next time.